flight is in theaters right now, there's early Oscar buzz for Denzel Washington. So I thought it would be cool to share with you guys an experience unlike anywhere else on YouTube. You're gonna get a chance to be up close and personal with the writer, John Gaines. Congratulations, dude, on, on bringing this story to the big screen. You've Thank done you. a lot of sports mo movies over the years. I from have. Summer Catch and Hardball to Coach Carter. Now you're stepping into a, a different arena. Good morning, Trina. Good morning, Captain Whitaker. Here's your manifest with 102 souls on board. Let's get them tucked in. We're ready to push. Where did the idea begin originally? Well, I'm a nervous flyer. Uh, so I think my fascination and fear with planes was, you know, part at the core, you know. And I was working on a movie with a bunch of naval pilots who really scared me because they were kind of heavy drinkers. So, and a lot of them become commercial airline pilots. And I was flying back from Europe on a plane with a pilot who was deadheading home, they call it. He was in his pilot blues, but he wasn't at work. So he started chatting me up and I was like, I just want this guy to shut up. And I couldn't figure out why. And the truth was that I realized I didn't want to know anything about him. I didn't want to know that this pilot was going through a terrible divorce or, you know, his kids hated him or maybe he's an alcoholic. And I was like, oh no. And then I was like, what if? What if there was a pilot who was like in this horrible spiral in his life and everything was falling apart? So I had the character in mind and then I was like, let's put him in a really amazing situation where he has to do a heroic piece of flying. And if he pulls that off and then it kind of gets revealed, it was like, what would happen? The crash scene in yeah. flight is absolutely terrifying. <laughs> translates on screen, how did it read on the page? Uh, it was very detailed. It was always a very detailed sequence in the movie, which in studying all these NTSB reports, I borrowed and then would ask pilots, like, would this happen and could you do this? And so I really wanted like this verisimilitude that was scary and I wanted the reader to really engage in it. So it's very dense description in there, but it always was effective because people who read the script were always like, man, I was sweating by page 11. Like I just was not happy to be on that plane, even on the page. Yeah, a lot of the marketing obviously presents the story with the selling point of yeah. there's this crash, but then when you see the film, it's really a story about addiction and a guy overcoming yeah. his demons and yeah. battling himself and trying to get out of his own way to find happiness and success. Right. Talk a little bit about when you're writing a character like this, do you meet with alcoholics? Do you meet, did you go to AA meetings? Well, you it's, you know, the one thing, Denzel said a funny thing, we were on a panel, they asked him, they said, what do you think about this guy being a pilot? And Denzel said, look, John did the most dramatic thing. He said, had he made this guy, you know, if the guy worked at the post office, wouldn't be as dramatic. He's like, you wouldn't get your mail. He's like, you know, but the fact that he's a pilot and has all of these people like, you know, in his control, he said is a really dramatic thing because as a nervous flyer, I did all this research too about people who fly, like anybody, just us who get on planes. And it, it told me that one third of people have an acute fear of flying. So that means when you get on an airplane, that energy you feel, that strange energy on an airplane, that's the third of those people that are really scared of being on that plane. I mean, I'm probably one of them sometimes. I'm a little bit borderline. Sometimes I fly and it's not that big a deal. Then certain times I start to think and I'm overthinking, I'm like, I'm not happy to be on a plane. But like when you get on an airplane, you see, like if you and I were in a car right now, I'd be driving. That's just who I am. I like driving, I like being in control. I get on an airplane, whoever's behind that door, they're in control. It's like, that's a funny energy to be kind of involved yeah. in, so, you know. But to give an addict that power right. over other people's right. lives. And what I, something I love, and it's very authentic to it, if you've ever met anybody who's battled alcohol abuse, right. Right now, they're constantly making little deals. And I noticed yeah. that throughout the movie, that yeah. Denzel's constantly saying, all right, I promise, just right. till, give me, let me stay at your house for a couple days, right, and then right, I'll be right. good. Yeah. They're bartering, yeah. and they're making little deals yeah. to kind of stay ahead. Tell me a little bit about that sort of, I don't well, know, pattern with, with addicts, you think? Yeah, I, well, I mean, we, we did this thing, it was funny, because Don Cheadle's character in the movie, we kind of told Don, we were like, look, he's kind of the devil. And we were afraid that Don was gonna look at us like, are you guys insane? And we're like, and he went right with it. He said, no, I get it, I get it. He was like, you know, he, he was the ultimate angel then got kicked out. And it's like his way to get back into the good grace is to turn somebody's soul. So that scene in the movie where he says to him, look, man, he turns to Denzel and says, this was an act of God. And Denzel says, whose God would do this? And he realizes this isn't gonna be easy. He says, here's the deal. So it's like, you're gonna make a deal with me. I'm the devil. Like, here's the deal with the devil. Like, I'm gonna wipe this away, but you gotta kind of come along for the ride. And Denzel's kind of like nodding along the time. So there was a lot of that deal making going on, which I thought was kind of interesting because every character has their own kind of agenda in a way. 
I really enjoy the choices of music, and sometimes in scripts you read yeah. them and they it references a particular right. song, and then they can never clear that song, and they have to do something else. But well, Zemeckis film, is, a, I mean, obviously, you know, he's done it many times. Like the 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 soundtrack to Forrest Gump is like insane. Yeah, it's like every you know iconic you the know, music American. in this is it's terrific, like, and, and it's the and same it's thing. There I mean, for a reason yeah. to move the story along and convey right. emotion. So when right. you're writing the script, you're choosing out which songs. I, I did imagine. like the Rolling Stones. I wrote into it from the beginning, but again, I never thought this movie would get made. You know, much less I never thought it would actually read the script. So I just wrote whatever I wanted into it. So writing the Rolling Stones into it was you know just for fun, and Zemeckis is a guy who can actually make it happen. Yeah, so. it's, a, it's a great in-depth character study uh, and, uh, and a wonderful job of bringing this guy to life, of course, done by Denzel Washington. But you write John Goodman's character, who Harley it, has two very pivotal moments yep. in the film, and there's a, a buzz in the theater when he walks on screen. <laughs> Talk a little bit about well, the importance of writing supporting characters in a piece like this. Well, you know, Harling Mays is special to me because I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of people about Harling Mays because I would argue that everyone has a Harling Mays in their life, and I might have been somebody's Harling Mays as a younger man. And I would also argue that Harling Mays is a guy that truly loves Whip. He's the one character in the movie that is the most pure of heart when it comes to him. He doesn't want anything from him. I mean, he may be a drug dealer, but doesn't mean that he's not capable of love. And I, you know, people really like to talk about that, but look, the fact that people cheer for this guy to re-enter, like, about to commit a felony is kind of, you know, that's, you gotta, that's a special character. Something I love to do when we have people hang out on the show is to ask you guys at home to send me some questions. So we've got a couple questions from fans of Flight on Twitter, if you'll indulge yeah, me for sure, a moment sure. here. All right, this comes from at Mike Snedegar, who asks, how do you feel about improvisation within your scripts, and was there any in this film? That's a great question. There is one phenomenal improv in the movie which, I, you, I mean, if you've seen the movie, you probably know what it is. It's when Goodman looks at the guard and says, CeeLo, I need you to wait outside. <laughs> which totally just came from him being like a great observational comedian who literally just kind of was like, I'm gonna use whatever's in front of me. And there was the, the gentleman we'd hire to play the guy. He, was, he just looked at me and said, CeeLo, I need you to wait outside. It's like, on the set, we couldn't keep it straight. You know, we just fell out laughing, so. Well, this sets up our next question perfectly. Adrian Charlie asks, uh, if comedy was necessary to balance the film. And yeah. Obviously it was. Absolutely. You. I mean, I, I mean, if without, without John Goodman and that character, I just think it gets really exhausting. We need a little bit of break. You know, we need a break from it. This is from my buddy at Charles Thorpe, who, by the way, said you were great at New York Film Festival. Oh, cool. Uh, I want to hear more stories he heard from actual pilots while interviewing them. Any oh, stand man. out for me? I, I don't York remember experience. if he remembers. I, I'm, well, there, you know, one of the pilots, you know, is a good friend of our family, so. He was saying, look, you know, when I go to work, I find out what tail number I'm flying. He's like, and I fly these planes enough, because he'll do routes continuously. Like some of them, it's like, I remember he was doing, I think, Newark to Washington, D.C., and he would do that loop a couple times a day. And he said, I'll get the tail number, and I'll be like, oh, that's Bouncy Betty. It's like, like he knew certain planes, and they had certain kind of issues to them. You know, it's oh, like, wow. this one's kind of bent, it flies a little bit sideways, or this one really bounces. I was like, I don't need to know No, anymore. I don't want like, to know that's, about that's bouncing. That's too much inside baseball for Betty, me. You know. Too much inside baseball for well, me. Well, speaking of baseball, this isn't from Twitter. This is from one of my oldest friends, John Budish, and one of his favorite movies of all time is Summer Catch, which you wrote. Okay, I did, yeah. How did Billy Brubaker pan out in the bigs? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Did he ever really adapt to wooden bats? <laughs> these are questions these are that good, my friend really John wants want to know. To know. Look, yeah. I understand. Uh, well, look, man, hitting with a wooden bat is not easy, as we well know. Did Ryan Dunn ever mature, <laughs> or was his shoddy makeup the end of him? <laughs> he, uh, uh, I, think, I think, you know what? As a lefty who didn't throw 90 plus, he probably struggled. Okay. That would be my answer. John, I think you're freaking out. John, who's in studio with us. So, Buddhist, relax. <laughs> yes, relax. Don't worry. You Summer Catch 2 is coming, I promise. Let's take it to the beginning of your career. At what age in your life did you realize that writing professionally was something you were going to be able to do? Wow. Well, you know, I started as an actor. and But I think that, you know, I come from this Irish storytelling family. So... Since the time I was a little kid and I'm the youngest of four, it's like I kind of had to fight for any kind of airtime. So I was always trying to tell stories and try to be entertaining. So 
my first instinct was to be an actor. And I think that in the years I was trying to be an actor, it was always about storytelling and I loved reading scripts. So it was about the time I was in my early 20s that I started to really, you know, write and dabble with writing. So. And obviously people always say, write what you know. And if right. you look at your resume, uh, you write a lot of sports movies. Right, right? yeah, I played a lot of sports. sports. I played a lot of sports growing up, you were yeah. probably a huge yeah. athlete, was, yeah. right? I played a lot of sports, a lot of, a lot of baseball. I played soccer in college. So. What makes a great sports movie, you think? You know, drama. People like real stories. You know, I think they like to connect. So anytime something, you know, fantastic happens in sports, there's a couple of us, me and John Lee Hancock and, you know, uh, Mike Rich, like guys who make a lot of sports films. Like, we all kind of start exchanging emails. It's like, hey, did they call you yet? <laughs> it's like, because they know that they'll want to make a story about it because those, they tend to make great movies. Real Steel 2 is coming, It right? is, it is, it is. Is that official? Is that happening? We see Anthony Mackie back in Real Steel? Oh, I love Anthony Mackie. Such a good that actor, is, isn't he? I'm telling you, he's the top. He's awesome. I love that guy. So, I mean, that, that film did very well, obviously. It did, it did. Well it did. with families, it did. and there's rumors of a sequel. Is that happening? Yes, we have a script that we really like, and we're kind of trying to find the right pocket because Sean is very busy. The director is really busy, and this guy Hugh, um, oh, he's what's Wolf his name? Wolverine, the Wolverine D guy, Jackman. Yeah, he guy who sings yeah, and yeah, dances yeah. and like makes all men look terrible. Yeah, he's got a movie coming yes. out. Yeah. So um, that guy, I tell you, is the best guy. He's my, I'm telling you, he's the best guy. Have Any you, genre, have you met him? many times. Any genre of movie he can do. He does musicals, he can do anything, on stage. He can do, anything. He can do drama on stage. Yeah, the other thing too is, I met the guy, and it's like. He's big, but not like big, like he's really big. Yeah, he's like, large, I mean, dude. I couldn't believe how big he was. He does like magic tricks. He's like, and when we were on the set of Real Steel, he'd be like, John, you want me to have him bring the weights up? And I'm like, okay. So like literally me and Hugh Jackman, like lifting weights before, you know, so I'm like, how come same he looks? Si same size weights, right? Always, same yeah, balance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then you got another movie on the way that is shooting in March called Need for Speed. Need for Speed. Based off a video game? Well, the, the electronic arts game Need for Speed, which is, you know, been around for 17, 18 years, which is a really cool, like, racing game. It doesn't have any narrative in the game, as you gamers know, so we, you know, developed a narrative and uh, we worked with Electronic Arts to kind of um, come up with this great ensemble story, which is really cool, and we, you know, we've got uh, a great cast. I would imagine that having kids, it's gotta be so cool to now have to adapt a video game. Trust me, the right? fact, you don't understand, the fact that, like, I say to them sometimes, hey, I'm going up to see Electronic Arts because of, you know, Pat O'Brien, who's the, the executive at, at Electronic Arts that's working with us, he's become their personal Jesus because he'll say to me, oh, oh, do your kids like FIFA? And it's like, do my kids like FIFA? So it's like, I've got FIFA for every platform. It's like every game like comes to me and I give it to my kids. They're like, it's the greatest thing. Your wife's like, why can't you just write like an 1800s period piece with no video game to it? Right, yeah. Or, or like an SAT prep course movie. <laughs> yeah, it's like, so can't cool. you write that? Can't you write the perfect score part two? <laughs> the Princeton Review, yeah, like, there. you know, in theaters in January. Hey, for any aspiring writer out there, what's a great movie they should go back and watch for the writing, you think? Uh, Unforgiven. It's a great movie. If you haven't seen that movie, watch that movie. It's it's a classic classic western, but has just such good characters and like it just has like that movie's magic. That's Shawshank's another great movie, yeah. but I mean that's based on a great you know a great novel. As just well. keep it in like the Morgan Freeman world. Oh yeah, you can't go scripts. wrong. There you you go. cannot go wrong. Actually, for my Princeton Review movie. I think I'm gonna get Morgan Freeman. He would it's teach the SAT prep class. If you had Morgan Freeman in your head while you were taking the SATs. Yeah, perfect score. Uh, I'd gone to Harvard. Straight to Harvard, yeah, exactly. exactly. Well, be sure to check out John's latest movie, Flight, which is in theaters right now. And you can see him hanging out at the Clipper games, cheering for Chris Paul. Absolutely. Go Knicks. <laughs> Later. <laughs> JB Smoove and Garfield give their review of The Hobbit, even though they haven't seen it. Jesse Miller pedals 3D glasses to any and all moviegoers, promising an extra dimension to their experience. Uncle Al and Jack discuss The Hobbit, Harry Feet, and The King of the Rings. Grey Drake gets all bookish as she lists her top 10 movies based on books. Ben Lyons talks movies and more with special guests Matt Belloni and Andre from Black Nerd Comedy. Devin Faranci takes you on a tour of some of the most famous movie locations in Los Angeles. Get your film fix. Subscribe to Cinefix.